I'm Rora. I'm Jane. And we are Birds of Clay. And we're here to talk all things Australian pottery and ceramic art. So put your kettle on and let's have a chat. We would like to pay our respects to the traditional custodians on the lands on which this podcast is recorded. We acknowledge the rich history of art, craft and storytelling that has been occurring for millennia and acknowledge elders past, present and country as provider, protector and guide. Working with clay is intrinsically linked to country and we would not be here without the care and connection that our First Nations peoples have shown for thousands of years on this continent we call Australia. Hey Jane. Hey Rora. And hello, Shannon Garson and Sarah Rayner. Hey Jane. Hey Rora. (laughs) Nice to be here. It's so amazing that you're accommodating us in your house. Sarah, thank you so much for having us. Um, We've been looking forward to this day for a long time. We have. (laughs) Such a treat. (laughs) It it really is. Uh, So, a little intro. Uh, Sarah and Shannon both make their work on Unibara country, uh, situated in Mullaney on the Sunshine Coast, both with work inspired and influenced by their deep connection with nature. And it's amazing and very evident in that. <laughs> yeah. I'd just love to hear about how you guys got into clay. So we might go with Shannon first, if you'd like to tell the story about why clay and how clay. <laughs> Well, um, I went to art college in the early 90s and I majored in painting and I went to that college because I um, knew that William Robinson was teaching there and I really wanted to work with him because he's a drawer and a painter. But by the time I got there, he had left. (laughs) Oh, no. Yeah. So then it was very, very conceptual um, and there wasn't a big emphasis on technical quality of drawing and painting. Um, or, in fact, on actually making objects of, that we would call paintings or drawings on paper. Um, so, yeah, I found it quite a hard road through art college and a group of us met these women, Monica, Asha and Clary Lawrence, who were running a little studio and they wanted people to decorate for them. So all, uh, there was about six of us and from the painting department we just went to Clary's studio and she threw pots they were both production potters and um, we decorated and they loved all things that we loved like historical textiles and beautiful um, cups and saucers and decorative things and fairy tales and you know all these sorts of things and um, Monica uh, well I should say David Usher has the good fortune to have to be married to Monica. <laughs> and, um, yeah, so he was decorating too and it was just this amazing creative um, situation that I don't think has ever existed in Brisbane before or since where a bunch of kids from art college had this opportunity to work with production potters in an actual working studio and we made mm. work and had exhibitions and sold work and all of us just were in awe of the older um, potters, the two women and David, you know, they were on their way and they were living a fully artistic life and we were all sort of like um, anthropologists. We were like watching them to see how they did things and how they lived and um, it was an amazing education. I was just so lucky and so that's how I got into clay and it was like the door just opened. Suddenly I didn't have to you know, just make these things that were totally divorced from skill or technique or material, um, which was the focus at college. It was pretty much solely concept. I actually was in this world of material, the clay, and, you know, engaging in concepts that I was interested in. Um, And that started sort of with historical, um, probably more historical concepts and stuff, but I've always really liked plants and flowers and so over the years, my interest has sort of morphed oh, maybe away from the historical, although, you know, I still do have a little 
hint of historical stuff, especially in my tableware. Like it does refer to the ceramics of the past, the 30s and 40s, sometimes Victorian mm -hmm. things. And, but um, my exhibition work probably tends more towards geology, plants, fauna, flora, you know, that sort of thing. Yeah, beautiful. And so we have Sarah here. And so how do you guys actually know each other? Oh, we actually met in Brisbane and um, I was in the process of moving to Mullaney and it was a really fortuitous meeting at, um, I think it was Craft yeah. Queensland then, and we both, I was exhibiting, I used to work with um, textiles and fabrics and um, had a show and Shannon was giving a talk and we met at the... Um, um, yeah, at Craft Queensland. So, um, but it's you know, so crazy formed a... Because it wasn't, wasn't like we hung out there. No, it was no, just no. Like one day we no. were there together. Yeah, <laughs> and so so we just sort of met and um, pretty much a year later I was in Mullaney. Um, I wasn't using clay at all at that stage. Um, I've... Um, the materials that I probably used more so were textiles and mixed media metals um didn't I grew up with clay my mum is a ceramicist and my brother um and you know the kiln wood kiln in the back garden and mum was always throwing I hated clay completely had no no friendship with it <laughs> whatsoever I didn't like feeling of it on my hands I um I used Clay a little bit. I studied at uh, USQ and did a little bit of moulding, etc., with porcelain. But really went on to do textiles and printmaking and and lecture within that area. And I um, was exhibiting with my work. Um, I had a young family and the realities of <laughs> earning a living, so um, had to move a little bit away from my artistic career in terms of um, exhibiting and do more market-driven work. And as the kids got older, I started, there was a little opportunity to really pursue my arts practice again. And I did a workshop with um, an artist called Craig Medson and did a, you know, a very rudimentary plaster object that I was quite excited and it was carving. Um, and I I've always had a tendency to work three-dimensionally. And by then, Shannon and I had formed more of a friendship. We would catch up, you know, for lunch here and there. And I showed Shannon my very rudimentary <laughs> sculpture. And Shannon said, you should use clay. And I was like, I hate clay. Like, I don't like the feeling of it on my hands. I've never really had a relationship with it. And Shannon said, no, 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 porcelain's a completely different beast. And also you can use it... Um, when it's like leather hard and carved back into it and so I was quite intrigued and Shannon was incredibly generous with her skills and her knowledge and invited me into her studio and I had a, a little corner which was amazing I was watching Shannon work was in awe of of what you know Shannon's process and what she did and I had a little corner and um you know I'd sit and carve away and we'd chat and um, and I fire my work with um, at Shannon's place, and Shannon showed me how to do terrace gelata, and you know it was a whole um, sort of launch into into using clay. And eventually, I you know moved my studio, or, or I set up a studio at home, and um, continued my practice at home. But Shannon and I've continued our um, catch up every week, and and you know have lunch and talk about art and life and the universe and everything <laughs> i know i feel like we've we've been here this week for it you guys. we had lovely snacks beforehand and yeah. got to see what a strong friendship and support that you have between you which is really beautiful it, it's fantastic and we're really lucky i mean we do live in a rural area so um you know Mullaney's quite far away from all the things that are happening even just in brisbane and then of course sydney melbourne etc and it's fantastic to have someone who you respect and admire to exchange notes and you know critique each other's work and just just really nut out ideas 
talk about um, what's going on in the world and how that's affecting what we do within our practice, family life, etc. Yeah. You know, all these things feed in into um, your work in one way or another. Yeah. Yeah, great. Um, so a lot, a lot of people will know both of your works, but a lot, so there's probably some people listening who don't. So do you guys just want to share a little bit about what you make? Shannon, I know we've heard a little bit about your pots but Sarah maybe just a little bit more and Shannon if you want to jump in and add anything that'd be great too. So I tend to work um, sculpturally I'm really uh, inspired by Australian native plants and particularly the reproductive organs of plants so um, fruits and and uh, seed pods and you know pollination and that sort of metamorphic change from de- developmental stage right through to you know flower um and and pods um so that's my starting point i'm not trying to replicate any of those objects i'm inspired by um the you know the actual objects themselves and then i look at distinguishing features and start to um exaggerate and change and morph those a little so that's my starting point i really only use I don't use glazes at all um and I the objects are fairly small like held within my hand um I only fire the work once and uh with a terra sigillata coating which just gives it a really beautiful satin finish um and I tend to work in with collections of objects so I'm I'm really interested in like museums collections of of objects and artworks how objects bounce and relate off um to one another or relate to each other and that you know my my house is full of collections of all sorts of objects so there's this combination of this external um my external environment and my internal environment i guess it all feed into my practice that's beautiful. <laughs> Thank you. And we've been very lucky to see oh, yeah. um, some of these beautiful collections today <laughs> and see, yeah. Mm-hmm. A little bit of insight into your processes and how you work and how you collect your spaces. It's really, yeah, feels really special. Yeah. So, no, it's great to have you both here. <laughs> oh, it's a treat. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah. Shannon, you're a will thrower yeah. predominantly. Yes. Yes. So, only really. Oh, only no. Really. Yeah, ninety five percent. Yeah, so Shannon, would you be able to tell us a little bit about um, what goes into what inspires you? What goes into making a vessel? Yeah, so um, I throw on the wheel, and I've got two bodies of work. One is what I call tableware, and the other one is exhibition work. So tableware, I can repeat again and again, um, and people can order it. Um, and exhibition is one off pieces. Um, when I say tableware, it sounds like I'm a production potter. But actually, I'm like the most pathetic production potter. <laughs> My process is too complicated to really um, be good production. Um, but, yeah, it sort of works on a production model, yeah. which I kind of love. Like, um, yeah, I love that stu- that old studio model and the idea of production, which is making the same thing again and again um, to a high level of sort of um, consistency. Um, and, yeah, all my decorations are hand-drawn or painted, so there is a production element to it in that um, I do it again and again, but each one is more or less like a separate drawing. So it's like I've done 10 billion drawings now of a paddock, which yeah. is one of my designs that I've repeated many times. So, um, yeah, the process for the tableware and the exhibition work is pretty different. Um, with the tableware, I might think of an idea. It might even just be a colour. Like one time I thought, oh, yeah, I need a bit more yellow in my, you know, my oeuvre. <laughs> and so then I'll think of something that can relate to that. But it's always inspired by something I'm looking at. Um, and exhibition work, always what I do is I, I, call, I, I call it a creative framework. So I go out into an environment and I walk in it and I take photos um, and that might only last for half an hour or an hour because, like, until quite recently I had pretty little kids and I just couldn't get out into the 
wild to do like massive amounts of research. So yeah, I just developed this way. So I take photos, I come back, I put them on my computer, I edit them, um, and then I print them into photo books. Um, and by that time, I've looked at the environment through my eyes, the camera, the computer, and then printed it on mm. a book. So I'm really like able to break down like the patterns in the environment, the lines that are coming out, the colours that are really, you know, coming out. Um, and once I've got those photo books, I can be in my studio and I throw whatever vessels I'm looking at for that particular project and then I start drawing. And I draw on raw porcelain and I nothing can go wrong because it's not that kind of process. Like <laughs> you just go forwards with the drawing like you never can, you never rub out, I never do drafts. I just start with blank porcelain forms and I just start drawing. <laughs> yeah, I did a workshop with Shannon. I was very lucky. Um, a few years ago, that was actually my step between making pots in at home and not doing anything and then going to uni and really launching into ceramics. So thank you so much. Aww. It was mm -hmm. a wonderful, wonderful workshop. But I remember you like, just keep going. Just <laughs> keep adding. Like just keep seeing where it's going to go. And it was something I was scared of was – that kind of keep you on going, but it's your forms, like your decoration or your surface design and the story is really powerful and beautiful. And I have taken that into oh, my I'm practice so too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's a bit of an unusual way to approach things because throwing is not like that. Mm -hmm. Like there's a way of doing it and it's right when it's right. Yeah. And so the throwing and the drawing are two kind of really different processes. Yeah, but I like how you you really bring them together. Another thing mm. I remember clearly in that workshop was you said you don't do drawings on paper because you're like, well, that's flat and 2D. Well, a pot has this whole other realm of surface that creates a different um, response from you. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, beautiful. And also the thing I like about vessels, like over the years I've, I've often asked myself, you know, why do I still use thrown vessels? Like why don't I make a sculpture or why don't I just make a sphere that's closed or whatever? But um, I love the whole human history of us with a handle or us with a spout or, you know, mm. every vessel, we are just humans and vessels evolved together like literally as we evolved vessels evolved and so we have this massively long history where i i like to think of it as that we think we're in charge of our inanimate objects but they're actually in charge of us <laughs> yeah, yeah like if something so has a handle we are compelled to touch it by the handle mm, pick it up. <laughs> in a certain yeah. way mm. and we have as humans no control over that impulse <laughs> yeah, the object is yeah, working yeah. on us <laughs> it's like this is something I'm really interested in like co-creating meaning and I think in the postmodern kind of realm we got into and probably was the height when you went through yes. uni it was all like nothing has meaning let's break down the meaning let's well I think now we're starting to go oh no material has agency yeah and mm. material holds Absolutely. meaning yeah. and we're creating meaning with it yeah it's not this neutral thing yeah, that we all just put our meaning on. It's actually got its own energy and agency. Yeah, I'm really passionate about that. I love it. <laughs> but I, I, I do. I, sorry, I was just thinking about Shannon's work and also that interacting with the object and and drinking tea and how that you know you have that social sort of aspect of of that as well. But beautiful little markings on the base of the cup where someone else is seeing that underneath. You know, you you as the the person drinking are, are sort of interacting with the cup, but it's it's bringing somebody else into the um, the experience with the way that you work with those forms. Yeah. yeah, and also all the realms, like all the ways we use a vessel too. Like yeah. we drink yeah. out of it. I remember you saying when someone's washing it up you flip it over and put it in the dish rack well you do it yes. in our place because we don't have a dishwasher <laughs> um, and you see that and yeah. it's like a, a little communication between yeah. the artist and the it user is. or the, the mm, cleaner yeah. in that case yeah. Yeah, yeah yeah beautiful 
I, I guess even, I mean, I'm very much working sculpturally and not mm. functionally, but in terms of um, the subject matter, it's very much about a vessel, a, a container. I feel it's a very sort of female connection as well. Um, you know, the seed pod and is is the protector and, and the holder of that sort of next generation but there's there's a lot of connections there even though you know it's a completely it's not about functionality um in terms of human interaction it's documenting in, in a way and sharing knowledge of how a plant goes about nurturing and fostering but um so i still i i think of them as as vessels but yeah there's quite obviously but the know. function of the plant is like a really important part of your um, oh, well, the exploration well or exactly i mean that yeah. goes back to say the 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 pollination how do they attract pollinators um and and plants have evolved you know they're quite tenacious in 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 the way that they have evolved different methods to um survive to attract pollinators to um, you know, pass on to the next generation. So, yeah, all of those aspects definitely. But how did you practice. feel when you moved from using textiles in a really practical way, making handbags that had to function in a certain way, to using sculpture? Oh, that's an interesting question. I guess, I, you know, no, 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 it is a good question. <laughs> I love it. But, but in the same way, I know the handbags had a functionality, but then there, there is also that element of, of it being a vessel. And another part of my practice, I guess, is that sort of opening and closing and revealing mm. and hidden and those sorts of um, conceptual aspects that come into the practice. So there's, to me, they're... they're the same I know their functionality mm. is is quite um quite different but um yeah I'm going to think further mm -hmm. on that that question I I mean having used textiles I would say in my more I've done very practical textile work and fashion and clothing and more um you know very much sculptural work but there's always it was always um a reference to you know there was I'd use zippers and hooks and eyes and so there's always been this reference to opening and 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 even disguise and and shelter and yeah mm. so they're all aspects I guess that come into play within mm. the porcelain and I think even a lot of my textile methods and ways of stitching um now that I've kind of made friends with porcelain which has taken <laughs> quite a while of working with the medium I'm I'm using a lot of those methods that I would have used in my stitching and sewing in my actual um practice now with the porcelain wow that's very interesting how they look how the both mediums so tactile how they marry but they're so different. they're so mm. different yeah, they're yeah. so different and they have such different qualities but they're yeah, there's there's a, a lot of similarities and I'm really discovering them the more I've worked with the material, that's for sure. Yeah. Well, they have similar histories too because oh, I know... Absolutely. Yeah yeah, yeah. yeah, they really document, you know, our sort of social structure and a lot of times um, ceramics would actually tell us about the textiles traditionally of our times mm. in terms of imprints and so the textiles you know doesn't last it, it yeah, um yeah. well you know they last forever now because it's all polyester but <laughs> when you have beautiful natural fibers often um understanding that history of textiles is through clay you know just by oh, by the imprints within clay so they're really mm. embedded and it's you know too i see it as a that sort of functionality does really play into um, early civilization and what what fabric was, you know, vessels, clothing, shelter. They they're all really interconnected. So um, yeah, I often think about the crossovers between those two materials. I'd like to marry the two. You know, I'm, yes, I, I do that. I, yeah. I, I look. I'm playing and um, with various you know ways of doing that but um it's got to be right they have yeah. to be talking to each other in the in the right way so that's to come yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's always like, good to have somewhere yeah to <laughs> I, mean, I, I still use you know i definitely i'm using things like pins and and entomology pins and so yeah. some of those aspects of, of you know the sort of textiles haberdashery items are, are 
playing a role in my practice now, but more will come. Yeah, yeah beautiful. Yeah. <laughs> Um, I have a question. Now, you each touched on, I guess, before our interview, your process and how, how you start, Shannon. You said you were walking through paddocks and you document and you search. And Sarah, you, you do something similar where you walk through nature. And um, I just wanted to ask about the importance of ritual in your process and also, you know, being in your studio and what what those spaces are like for you and how sacred and important those are because it's something you've both mentioned. So Yeah, I, I never thought of it as ritual, but I think, yeah, now you've said that word. <laughs> I'm like, oh, yeah, artists are incredibly superstitious. <laughs> and uh, I think, yeah, getting that creative framework um, is a really good way for people who are busy or find it hard to get into their art to set up something which would plunge you straight into a place where you can actually start making artwork without a creative framework. Um, um, I don't know how you would... Well, we all know that feeling where you go and sit in the yeah. studio and think, oh, what am I going to make? <laughs> I, I can't even think of anything. <laughs> so, yeah, and um, I knew from um, when I started that um, having a space for myself has always been really important um, you it's I do know some artists who create in their own kitchen or whatever but mm. I just am not that kind of artist no. I just need my own space um, so my my studio is under my house it's Queenslander um, and it looks into our backyard and um for family life, I just knew that this had to be really an important place that um, was not part of family life. It is part of work life, and I had to establish that really strongly early on. So no no kids were ever allowed to come in, in my studio and ask me questions like, where are my socks or <laughs> what are we having for dinner? That is not the... The place where they're allowed to ask that or then none of my family are allowed to get into a big flurry about something and come down and kind of vent to me in my studio the studio is the place where I work um every so often someone would try it and I'd be like we can't talk about this in the studio and we go outside to somewhere else so you know it's a real privilege to have enough space to be able to establish that but um for family life I think it's probably essential that artists establish that, especially because of the patriarchy, especially women. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, um, all the jobs of the house and the family can just end up piling onto your head and in that um, position you can never be creative. You have to make a space mm. and your family has to make a space and understand that it is your space. And then it's work. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It is work. It's like it's sort of like an inner sanctum though, you know. It's yeah. your, it is a, it, 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 I think it's quite a privilege to be invited into a, an, an artist's studio in many ways because there's lots of things going on there, like, you know, thought processes, things that aren't quite developed yet and so you're getting a little insight into something that's quite... You know, personal. personal and, and yeah. Um, uh, my studio is also in my house. So um, w what we, you know, pretty much the studio and the house are all one space mm -hmm. in my, you know, they're not separate. Um, everything feeds into each other. Um, I think earlier when, when um, Jane and Rora and Shannon and I had lovely um, chat and and shared food together and we were talking about the rituals um I, I guess things that you think aren't work and and often I would think I'm procrastinating you know I'd be walking in the garden and uh, observing and picking flowers and finding little objects and bringing them into my studio space and and spending time sort of scrutinizing them and and feeling like I'm procrastinating and and I've really learnt that they're such an important part and, and part of the ritual of making for me, part of, um, you know, it's thinking time, it's observing time and you're not always in there making, making. 
Um, so that's probably, you know, in terms of, of ritual, I've just embraced that as very much part of the work um, within my studio space. And, yeah, they are, you know, you do have to be quite strict as well. We Again, we were talking about how easy it is for people to not realise that um, just because you're at home, you know, that, that that's just a place to drop in and that you're not actually working. I think you have to be, you know, very strict in terms of with your art practice and, and that other people understand that if you're not, you know, you're not there and you're not making, then you're not earning an income or that, um, you know, threads of making can be broken up quite easily by people just sort of dropping over and... So it's about you taking it seriously yourself, I think, as a as an artist. But other people respecting the fact that this is your your work, your yeah. Mm. Um, and I, you know, I really believe that new conversations have to to be had o- over that for sure. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Especially within the arts, you know. Yeah. And and artists often, you know, there's also that attitude of of oh, we need a little bit of a drawing done. We'll just ask an artist to you know yeah. whip that up for <laughs> us and. And there's no money, you know, no. attached to that. No. Like you wouldn't walk into an architect's office and go, oh, look, I just want to build a little bit of a house and, you know, can you, <laughs> can you just do a quick sketch for me? And so, yeah. I mean, I know, you know, conversations are definitely being had over that, but, I yeah, it's got to go a lot further for sure. Yeah, <laughs> which I think leads into a big question, hey, which is how do you guys make this work? Like how do you mm. make being an artist work for you like how do you pay bills basically (laughs) it's one of those things I'm quite concerned about my at the moment I'm managing I think five casual jobs and uni and so and and making and yeah well one of those jobs is making that's I see yeah (laughs) Um, and I'm just completely (laughs) overwhelmed and I'm like how do you make it work yeah Mm. Yeah. Shannon do you want to it's really hard yeah I mean I, I think um being an artist is not for wimps. <laughs> and um, if you haven't got a tolerance for low income, being an artist might not be for you. <laughs> to be honest, in Australia, mm-hmm. like, it, you know, we know a lot of artists, a lot of really well known artists, and hardly any of them make anything like someone would make by working a different job. So it's a low income job. Um, so what I did is I had lots of part-time jobs. Um, I worked in cafes and stuff like that. And then um, this is like decades ago, 20 mm. years ago, I got on the niece scheme. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, and so then I thought, okay, I can get serious about this. But one thing I've realised since, um, you know, one thing that's come to me as I've become a more mature artist is that if you are to make a living with your art, you need products. Mm. You need a product. So it has to, you know, you have to sell something. It could be an object. It could be your knowledge. You could be Mm. a teacher. You know, whatever. You need a product. Um, And producing, manufacturing that product might not be the most creative part of the practice, but it supports other things. So if you can't, if you haven't got skills and you haven't got a product, then you can't be an artist basically. Mm -hmm. You can you can do it as a hobby, you know, but you when you're a full time artist, you're a worker and you're usually manufacturing something. You're a manufacturer. Um so yeah, that's one thing to really think of when you're an emerging artist. What is your product gonna be? What are you gonna make? What are you gonna become skillful enough at doing to sell? Shannon, you also you run a lot of workshops and do advisory work, and so they all feed into into your job as well. And and even as you were speaking about before, you've got two parts to your practice: so your exhibition work and your um, your yeah. tableware. And often, when you're working on an exhibition, that might be a year's worth of work where you wouldn't have another income. So you've got to be you know a bit clever about having these other things going. Yeah. So my tableware would be like my equivalent of working in a cafe or mm. having a part-time job. Mm. Um, how do you, sorry, except how do you, I love it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. How do you sell your tableware? Like, how, do you? Is it online? Is it in 
Um, like how do you get it to the world? <laughs> yeah, well, I'm just going through a bit of a transition with that right now, but previously I have sold it through gallery shops and um, craft fairs. I've done finders keepers a few times, different other sort of high-end high end sort of those one-off craft fairs that might happen once every six months or so. Um, I live in this beautiful town now and so um, there's a little kiosk I can hire. I have studio sales from there. Um, so that's what I've done previously. But now that my kids are just leaving home, like um, I'm thinking, oh, maybe I'll do it a different way because um, as your life changes, of course, your needs mm. are different. Uh, you know, when the kids were little, I just had to have my head down and just work, work, work all the time. Like that money just had to keep rolling in and rolling in. But now, you know, definitely when the teenagers leave home, mm. time and money are freed up. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, yeah, so now I think, oh, maybe maybe I'd like to try something different. I mean, I do have a really beautiful website and I love the online world. I love I love social media. And I, I was actually going to add in there, Shannon, you've really fostered a fantastic audience mm. through your your website, your newsletter and social media as well. So, yeah. you know, you've, you've brought an audience to your work. Yeah. You travel along, you're talking about the little kiosk in Mulaney, <laughs> which is an event that people will travel a long way to, you know, to come to Mulaney for one of Shannon's um, yeah, stalls yeah, yeah. there. Yeah, it's really fun. Yeah. But, yeah, I'm sort of thinking, oh, you know, maybe I could do more with my website shop. So maybe I'm looking at moving more into that. But also as I've become a more mature artist, the exhibition work has taken over more. So I have probably one or two a year and I might be in one or two group shows a year. So um, now it would probably my income would be about 50% tableware and 50% oh no 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 say 40% tableware 40% um exhibition and then 10% these other things where I might be on panels or judge things or you know get paid for sort of other more um academic -y kind of things mm -hmm. yeah. what about your um creative voyages and these experiences Oh, yeah. Because yeah. well, yeah. <laughs> there's more, I know. <laughs> well, a few years ago I thought, oh, you know, all these lovely people come to my stall and they are just so hungry to know, like, what my house is like, what I do. And um, I just thought, <laughs> oh, you know, if you don't know any artists, you would never see this. Mm. And the thing that is so nice about being an artist is that you know heaps of artists. Yeah. So I thought I'll put I'll start working to develop this luxury travel idea um, where uh, people come on these things called creative voyage. We stay in luxury accommodation. It's uh, usually in a region, so I've taken them to Tasmania, Byron Bay, and I'm doing one in Mullaney later this year. And we go and visit artist studios um, because the thing about artists is a lot of them have these other part-time jobs which enable them to entertain people really well. Like lots of them are cooks, <laughs> lots of them have worked in catering or running events or things like that. So, um, yeah, the small group tours, we go to artist studios. Um, we often have food with artists. Uh, people are sitting in artists' kitchens, you know, eating food with them, and it's this really kind of special intimate Immersive, insight yeah. into the whole life of an artist but one of the things that I love the best um, about it is that all the artists get paid by the head so if I bring 12 voyages they get paid a hundred dollars a head great so the artists themselves are actually able to use their amazing life that they have built and sacrificed so much for to to make money by sharing it with other people so I've tried to always run it on this model mm. where I will not ask an artist to do anything for me without paying them and I really let all the clients know that this is what we're doing here. We're engaging with mm. professionals and looking at their lives and it is worth money. It's worth paying for. That's yeah. wonderful. Mm. Yeah. yeah. I'm sure people just love it too, I think. It's pretty amazing. Yeah. I mean, I love it. Yeah, people do love it. Yeah. <laughs> well, we bet both 
tomorrow and I both We've been it off. Yeah. <laughs> We'd love to come. <laughs> oh, I would love you to yeah. come. Yeah. In, in a sense too, as you said, you're, you know, supporting all these people's practices via um, coming on the tour. I think it's amazing. Yeah. And, yeah, just from doing the markets, we know there's people, you know, that come and buy a mug off us and it's not just because that mug's nice. I mean, you can buy a mug at Kmart for $2. It's the story it, and yeah, it's the connection yeah. and the hand. It's and meeting the, you. It's, yeah, it's all part yeah. of exactly. It's yeah. that building community around yes. these beautiful um, practices. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Awesome. Yeah, and I feel like as artists in Australia, we, we only have a very um, a very – emerging community and very emerging understanding of this ecosystem that runs from artists right through to mm. like collectors mm. that this is a community and that we all support each other mm. and th there are ways that you can do it that are really beneficial for everyone yeah that's really interesting I've just been thinking about collectors because I was um was researching Grayson Perry and he's very upfront about collectors he's a ceramic artist in the UK um, and he did a pot with all the collectors' names on it or something. And I'm thinking, in Australia, we don't even, I don't even know what the collector kind of, you know, is there a collect community of collectors? Absolutely. And yeah, yeah. I mean, this is yeah. us in Toowoomba making mm. our pots in the laundry going, <laughs> mm. what is out there in Australia collector-wise? Mm. Yeah. I, I guess, uh, uh, you know, that's always sort of was another planet for, for me, um, I've started working with a a gallery in um, in Sydney probably for the last four years. So um, gallery Sally Dan Cuthbert and that that there Sally's like my agent, and and you know we work as a team. So she has contacts with all the, lots of people who collect the work, um, and it's it. It's quite another world, I think. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so I've had a, a little bit of experience with that um, lately from exhibiting in, in Sydney. You know, they're so important in terms of that. In some ways there's a philanthropic relationship to keep artists going as well. I mean, you know, a lot of people genuinely love and want this these artworks in their collections and and as artists you, you, you know you need that support to to keep earning money yeah, that's wonderful. <laughs> so yeah. um yeah one thing i saw um in america when i've been over there is this, this amazing very competitive collecting culture over mm. there that doesn't exist in Australia. Mm. It's quite different, I yeah. think. Yeah, and, like, I went to this guy's house. He lived out in the middle of nowhere and he had, like, a, an architect-designed house to, designed to display his collection. Yeah. And he was just so keen to know about Australian artists because he would be the only one who knew about them, who would be collecting mm. them. Like there's this whole culture over there that's mm. so different from anything we've got here and it's just like mind-blowing like how much passion there is and, I mean, it's a population thing mm. too but, yeah. I've got a wonderful collection of Shannon's work. <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, you know, I, I'm a collector of objects and artworks and, you know, the house is just about filled to capacity but you know there's there's levels of collectors but I think you need to you know there's a lot of young people who are just starting out collections of of um artworks and getting information out to them about different artists and what people are doing and uh, I think is really important and to foster those relationships um, in terms of galleries, you know, fostering an, an, an audience who will grow up to start to collect, you know, more work and, and probably spend as their income increases, spend more money on artworks, <laughs> which is definitely, I mean, I've bought, I've bought artworks since I was 18. Yeah, know? me too. And, <laughs> and I, you know, I can spend a little bit more now, which is really exciting and, and it's, I, I love having other artists' works within our home and yeah. I move objects around all the time and see them from different perspectives and pull things up into the limelight and put them away again. And so I think, you know, there's 
there's almost this sort of idea of the collector being this separate person, but they're you and me. You know, we're, we're all <laughs> yeah, so collectors. True. So <laughs> Do lots of trades. I've been yeah, enjoying Laura and I have done yep. lots of trades between us and it's beautiful having yeah. this object that I probably, you know, yeah, couldn't absolutely. pay for, yeah. but mm. yeah. can swap. And, oh, in yeah. my yeah. early career, that's a lot of the, you know, the work yeah. I collected was definitely through swaps. And, yeah. 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 It's really beautiful. We're saying um, because I've also done a fair bit of printmaking and yeah. print um, making. There's a lot of exchanges, yes. oh, which yes. is wonderful. So yeah. everybody will make a print, like a um, edition, and then True. everyone will get a one mm. copy and mm. in this beautiful portfolio. And we're going, how can we do this in ceramics? Yeah. So I think watch this space. I think there's going to be Uni's going to have a mug swap, that or a be cup swap. Amazing. Yeah. So whatever you interpret that as <laughs> so that should be really fun I mean mm. that's just a little fun thing we're doing at uni but I think ceramics yeah I'd love to see some of those more trading and more community building mm. happen in in our world yeah yeah sure. my collection's starting to grow a little bit it's got you know bits and pieces from everyone and my treasure shelf and it's really exciting and sometimes you can look at those objects and you know, be inspired. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. 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 I yeah. Um, I mean, you know, I, you do, like I think the swapping and, and um, is fantastic, but also you have to remember, like we were saying earlier, we're all running yeah. businesses as well. Yes, and so, you know, the part, part of that is great. And also having an audience out there and fostering that audience who are willing to collect your work and pay what it's worth, yeah. you know, um, like, what what you earn when you're starting out and and um, prices, or if you think about the you know how much you work per hour, <laughs> it's a little bit oh, a little bit scary. <laughs> I was thinking like I get asked now, and and a lot of my pieces take a long time. You know they can be a week or a few weeks making, and people will go how long you know how long does it take to make a piece, and and it's like it's that's thirty years of of practice for me that's come behind, you know, making whatever's happening now. And I think we forget that sometimes, oh, you know. It's so important. It's you go, oh, yes, yeah. a few weeks, but it's not a few weeks. You know, it's about all the all the things that we've just dis yeah. discussed. Yeah. And Especially when you're a thrower because it literally yeah. takes you. Yeah, to, to even like learn to. throw it. 12 cups in an hour. Yeah. 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 <laughs> but it's that skill and also, I mean, the cost of education now. Yeah. Like it's yeah. the yeah. cost of our degrees. It's or the cost of all the workshops I did mm. to learn how to throw mm. and those hours and hours mm. and it's blocks knowledge. and blocks of clay to learn how to yeah. throw. Yeah. And True. Yeah. And um, it's, it's very special, like, seeing each of your work as well because it's very um, clear looking at it that it's you've got each very defined, unique styles and strong voices in your work too that you've obviously developed over a really long time yeah, and, you know, long you. careers. Um, but that's kind of something Jade and I as, like, new artists are developing and still developing. And how did you develop your styles and your voices and you know, where have you meandered, like, going into where you are now? Well, I'll, I'll start. <laughs> I'm thinking about that one. Yeah. <laughs> it's a big one. Finding your mm. voice as an artist. Mm, absolutely. Yeah. 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 And it doesn't happen fast. And I think that uh, skill and technique mm. amplifies your voice. Mm. So if you don't even think about your voice but you just concentrate on being skillful or gaining technique, your voice will be amplified. Um, and, you know, that's probably the unsexy end of the, mm -hmm. you know, pottery spectrum but... Um, I think, yeah, you've got to you've got to put the hours in. You've got to become good um, for your oh, voice. To absolutely, come. you do have to. Or else your voice is a whisper, mm. and we've all seen that when we began. We make something, and it's like not really saying anything, and it's not really clear what we're trying to do. That well, that's when your voice is a whisper, and then you get more technique and more skill, and your voice louder. becomes yeah, louder and clearer. louder. Yeah, clearer. So, I mean, it took me ages, ages. More than 10 years. Mm. How did you stop? <laughs> like, how did you bring it in? Because I find, like, that's one of my issues. It's like, I'll have this thing, like, I'm making these porcelain cups and just colouring the inside. And they've been quite a thing. And everyone in is like, these are fantastic. And then I'm like, yeah, done with that. I want to make some weird sculptures. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But, like, how do you keep 
I guess on track. I, you or do. Like, the, uh, you yeah. do actually. That's you know. Often I will be in the process of making, and it's even you know talking earlier about bringing in textile elements, etc. Those things are always floating around in the back of my head. But until the work is ready, they I have to just. Sometimes you have to have sort of blinkers on, and and mm. um, especially like if you're working towards a, a, an exhibition and you're on a trajectory, like to get to to float off in other directions is quite dangerous because you're you know you, you you're unlikely to finish the body of work you're working on I you know I, I think you you need to keep evolving for, mm. for sure um, you need to have some kind of critical um, thing happening within your own head as to is this working is this saying what I'm wanting it to say is this going in the direction I want it to um, and 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 having a practice, you know, that word is has a meaning. It's about showing up each day and and um, and working on what you're doing. And it's not always going to, you know, do yeah. what you want it to do. And you can spend a day in the studio and squash it all up and start again the next day. But I think a focus and a um, and not being frightened to. You know, we all we all have something to say, and and you can really, you know, there's always that little voice in your head going, "Is this good enough?" And is it, you know, and and if you really question, good enough for who? You know, ultimately, you're probably your own worst enemy at at times. You know, if this is if this is good enough for me, <laughs> then and and I'm proud and of of this work. It's saying what I want it to say. Then. You know, it, I'm, I'm happy to put it out into the world, but I think we can be really good at stopping ourselves sometimes. So, I think you know, so, just do it, just make it. Yeah. And I would also say that, um, you know, when you, if you're in for the long haul, if you want to be an artist for decades, the word masterpiece refers to the masterpiece. Yeah. One masterpiece. We don't make a masterpiece every time we sit down. That's where your skill and technique comes in. You know, there may be times, and there could even be quite long times, like a, a year or something, where you make things that you personally, your voice inside is just going, oh, man, I've made that before. You know, that's just mm. the same thing. It's not It's not good. I mean, that voice is really quite cruel and hard, but... You know, you just have to fall back on your skill because you've got an exhibition to put out, and you've just got to put it out there. And 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 just you know, under, I mean, being an artist is like a very humbling job. <laughs> Sometimes is. you have to understand that you know your work will go out not looking the way you want it to look, and that is because you are a professional and you mm. can still do a good job even if it's not the masterpiece. Mm. Yeah, yeah. I think a lot of people that aren't artists have this misconception about people that work in art, like that we're all just doing what brings joy and that yeah. there's no measure of discipline involved, but it's totally not the case. There's so much discipline and building of skills. Absolutely. And and compromise. Yeah, and yeah, it's a hard job. Mm. Yeah, I mean, it's really rewarding, but it's a hard job and you do have to get in there for the long haul, I think. Yeah. And making art is not... The, the, I talked to you guys about this before. It's not the feeling that you get when you look at art. When you look at art, you get a feeling of being inspired and it could transport you or make you have feelings or this or that. When you make art, you're not involved in that experience of receiving. Like you're involved in the experience of making. So as a maker, it's a really different position that you're in. And, um, you know, we have kind of built up this myth that we're all, like, standing in front of a canvas, like, scribbling really hard, and it's like inspiration is just flowing through us, and that is really not what making art is like. Making art is work, and lots of people enjoy their work, including artists, but work is still hard. It's work. Yeah, absolutely. And, yeah, when I go and see art or when I come here to Sarah's house and see beautiful art that I love, I have a different feeling from the feeling that I have when I'm making it. And it's, yeah, it's not really about doing things that bring me joy or inspiration. When I'm making art, I'm involved in a different kind of um, feeling. Yeah, interesting. Yeah. How do you guys feel about 
something I guess I can only speak for myself, but I found it incredibly vulnerable making art and putting it in the world. Absolutely. Yeah. You, you are putting your heart and soul out there into the world and everybody's going to respond differently. You know, you're going to have people who love it, people that hate it. I think, again, we were speaking earlier about, you know, art evoking some kind of response, whether that's a good response or a bad response or you get people talking or... And in those terms, you know, then your job as an artist is 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 done, I think. But, um, no, it's... it's uh, Terrifying, and that never gets any better. Like oh, the, great. The, the, sorry, it doesn't. I, I, it's yeah. quite. Um, it, it's quite a sickening, scary feeling. Yeah, and then you know, and then all the the things that you have to do on top of it. You, artist talks and install the work, and <laughs> you have all these hats that you have and to write wear. The, list, uh, the gallery list, with yeah, all the bios and, and blah blah yeah, blah. Yeah, yeah and, well. everything yeah. that that comes with it. Um, no, it doesn't get any easier. And I think if you became complacent about all of those things, then probably you know you. You shouldn't be probably an artist, work, and eh? you're probably making crappy stuff. I don't look. I don't know. I think. I don't think. I think that continual questioning and and is it and am I and and is a is a good thing as as an artist because it's then you are you know approaching your work with some kind of you know critical mind behind it. But um, yeah, that trepidation I don't think goes away. Do you? Do no. you? No. <laughs> but also it's very hard to see your work when you've been in intimately involved mm. in it since it was a blob of clay and now it's gone through all these transformations mm. and and it's still just knocking around in your studio next mm. to all your old, well, your studio is really much more beautiful than most people's. <laughs> no, no, but I, yeah. It I, just doesn't look like it's going to look when it's in a no, gallery. No, you know, yeah. I pull out everything sort of towards the end of a show and, you know, often I'll sort of make and make and tuck it away and then pull everything out together and I give myself time to lay it all out and work out what pieces are going to sit together and how the work's going to interact and and take over the whole house. So, as I said, the hell house is the studio then. <laughs> but, um, yeah, and then you're looking at it going, oh, is this, you know, is this okay? Is it doing what I want? And I, pr I probably have got better, I think, at, you know, making assessments and going, yes, that's – and 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 having an idea and following that through. I mean, there's times where you – you start to second guess and perhaps you have to go no this is this is what I'm working towards this is you know I'm going to stick to this and and it's worth it in the end but there's definitely times along the way that you will question that and that's that's a good thing I think yeah it's that balance of creativity and critical thinking mm. it's that it's mm. kind of this back and forth mm. isn't it yeah. and it's great to get I mean we were talking about how um again in our earlier conversation how important having some kind of critical feedback is and how that doesn't you, you know we don't always get that and perhaps again living rurally you know it's difficult to have access to that sort of thing I'm lucky enough to be able to you know Shannon and I catch up once a week and and all of those things get discussed and we um and we because we both respect and admire each other's work and we you know we're honest with each other um it, it's it, we're getting some kind of feedback there but I think it's really important for artists to seek that or you know find someone it has to be someone though who you respect and and you also have to be willing you know to hear things that you might not want to hear at at times Oh, um, yeah, I mean, there'd be times where I've had an idea and you've just said, what, but why would you do that? <laughs> <laughs> but then that's the question, isn't it? Mm. Like, why would you do it? Mm. <laughs> oh, yeah, no, like we ask, we challenge each other and it's good to go away and, and yeah, but it's so important to have that. So if you can, yeah. you know, access, I, I think it's, I think, I think for artists to have access to that is, is probably something that, you know, even needs some more discussion in, in terms of I think it's so important, yeah. But also and, we've been talking for so long, I can sort of hear what you would yeah. say to me now. Like I've, <laughs> yeah. got, I've got your, your kind, critical voice in my head saying, yeah. but why would you do that? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So no, same, same, same. That's yeah. an important part of professional practice, I think, Yeah, getting a voice that you trust 
to criticize you. Yeah. But <laughs> but you also yeah. you have to bring that, you know, you can we can be very swayed by others um input. Mm-hmm. And so you don't need 20 people telling you what to do. You need your own self, you know, with with an idea and with moving forward and you need one or two people who you respect and that could be a professional within the field or a curator or another artist and you also need to know what you're asking them for. Mm-hmm. So, you know, a lot of people, you know, students and will send me things or ask for feedback or, or not ask very well and I'm, I have to go, well, what, what, you know, what, what are you, what are you asking here? Mm-hmm. Yes. Um, so that's important to know as well. You know, you can't expect somebody to solve all your, your, your problems in, in terms of how am I going to set this up or how am I, um, you know, I think you have well, to be. Well, something I probably would see, and you probably see a lot too, is when somebody has a project and it's not fully realised, like they're just not ready. So they would show you some work and it would be like, yeah, this is the start of the process. Mm. This is not the work that you're going to be exhibiting. Mm. Um but because of our kind of go, go, go culture and get out there, I think that is like a real step that's not very well developed in young artists to know when you're at the start of the work and mm. when you are When's it resolved? When's it finished? Yeah. 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 That's a really good point. It's something we talk about in our degree a bit. Mm. It's like what is resolved? Mm. Yeah. Mm. And... Yeah, I think sometimes resolved is that it's done by the deadline. Yeah, mm. which totally. isn't <laughs> which isn't mm. real world. No, no. Yeah. Like, I mean, I guess I guess there's a little bit we have exhibition mm. exhibition deadlines and stuff, but in the real world, but still, you need to have started the process earlier. It's not just a semester where you yeah come up with the idea, make the work, and hand it in. Mm. You know, and what's your intention? Yeah. Yeah, like if you signposted it as this is work on on its way to something Mm -hmm. else then and exhibited it in that context, it would be fine. But, yeah, I I think that um, you need to have a full understanding of your own full process and that means going through the whole process. Like lots of students, I think, only go through the first third of it and then they start again in the next semester, first third, first third, third, they never go through the full process. And that's not their fault because it's really actually hard to understand that when you're an emerging mm. artist, like what actually is the full process because you usually go through that boring period in the middle where you think, oh, well, this is probably finished. I probably finished with this. This is really boring now. But you have to kind of keep going. Yeah, which is what we were saying <laughs> earlier. You know, you really have to not be sidetracked by other things. It's like there's a, yeah, sometimes when you have an idea, seeing it through to resolution can be, there can be lots of boring parts and and a lot of, you know, repetitive kind of yeah. um, actions <laughs> along the way. <laughs> So much to think about. I know. I, I feel like I'm learning so much here in the big talk. Like, I'm like, oh, yeah. And also, th- like, just I think seeking critique that is a huge piece of advice that I'm going to go away with because mm. I'll have conversations with my husband because I, yeah, he's obviously been present for my entire like creative journey mm-hmm. um, through uni and honors and everything and just working from home and I'll, I'll ask his opinion on things and he's obviously extremely biased because he thinks everything is wonderful and I'm just like I'm seeking something from you that you can't give me mm. so you know, mm. maybe Jane I'll start yeah. asking you for that I love question. that I feel like my partner and mum are like the opposite <laughs> mum like, mum said to me she's like it's a little bit student isn't it <gasps> Outrageous. <laughs> so I've got too harsh of a critique. Yeah, there. no, I think it's important to seek, you know, the right people to, yeah, yeah. And, and often someone that you're not related to. Is... <laughs> yeah. Like yeah. I do seek yeah. Jeff's advice and he's got a really good critical eye and he, he, you know, sometimes he just goes, I have to see it in context. And, yeah. and which, you know, because I have this vision in my head of what it's going to be and I'm showing him something that's in a, in a process. Um, but, yeah, so there has to be a mix of your own, you know, you have to 
you have to trust in your own vision and in your own voice, but you, I think, yeah, seeking professional critical mm-hmm. advice is a really good thing. And I yeah. think a good critic opens the door. A like good criticism shouldn't make you feel like the door's shut and that you can't go there and you can never be an artist. It should always, like, leave the door open, you know, or open a new door for you to go through. Like, at the end of a good critique, you shouldn't feel kind of shut down and enclosed. And oh, no. You should no. feel like you've got a direction. That's the sign of a good critique, I reckon. How do you think that's done? Well, if I was critiquing someone's work... I was like, who's <laughs> I would probably ask them first how they felt about it. Um, so that opens a door straight away, right? Because most people, um, even the most confident of people, wouldn't probably say, I just love this. This is perfect. <laughs> <laughs> most people would have something to say. And then... Um, I can think of one or two. <laughs> <laughs> well, then I might say, uh, uh I have a bit of a feeling about this cup that there's somewhere else for it to go and it might be based around the handle. And then I would sort of see what they came up with from there. So, I mean, the last thing I would ever want to do, and I hope I've never done this and I hope I never do it, would be to make somebody feel like, well, I'm just totally shit and I shouldn't be an artist. I would never want someone to feel like that after talking well, to no, me. no, because you've gone to the effort of, you know, making mm. that object and, and you, yeah, yeah. yeah. You can't just shut shut it down completely, but it's got to be constructive. Yeah, and I mean, it's when when I've had good critique, I haven't felt destroyed at all. I've felt really hopeful and really optimistic and ready to go and and resolve some problems. Basically, that's how good critique sort of mm. makes you feel. Because you often know that there's problems. I yes. was going to say, yeah. I, I think I actually think you know. You, Often when you are seeking someone else's opinion, you know yourself that there's something not quite working and because you're such a part of that work, it's hard to see at times. But you know, as soon as someone goes, oh, look, I just think this is, you know, it just needs a little bit of tweaking or you go, oh, yeah, I do, yeah, that's yeah. what it is. Yeah. Um, and off you go and resolve that. Yeah. That's great. It also comes down to the intention of the critique. You can feel the intention of the person critiquing as well. So, yeah, they need to leave room for you. But also, like what you said before, it does take grit to be an artist. You have to be open to hearing these things as well. Yeah. Yeah. And no matter how how mature you are in your Mm. practice, you've still got things to hear. Just oh, absolutely, yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and things to learn. And there will always be, you know, pieces that you've made that you go back and look at later and go, oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> what was I thinking? <laughs> well, yeah. is there anything exciting that you're each working on right now or coming up for you both? Um, I've, I'm have i working towards some work for Sydney and possibly another project but I can't say much about that at this stage Ooh, so, <laughs> um, so yeah just just working away working away and I mean I like to have something to work towards but I can't if I stop making I completely lose my hand so I'm um, working towards I've just started I'm working towards a show at the University of Southern Queensland next Yay! year yeah. <laughs> so I usually give myself Sarah will just laugh. I give myself about a year for a show, but often the time gets squeezed, like, <laughs> extremely. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, in the meantime, while I'm working for that show, I'm still making tableware and mm. um, I've got a creative voyage coming up in July, so that'll be really fun. And, yeah, do, doing other things. Um, recently I went to my friend's house and I just saw this perfect coffee cup they had was made in the 1960s probably in Germany and I was like, oh, I'm going to try and make that in porcelain. So I've just made 12 of them, um, all just slightly different. Oh, good, I'm, need, I'm in the need of a new cup. Like a new <laughs> shape, so that's good, that's interesting. <laughs> yeah, so it just all jogs along. Something I've found is really good for me um, and it, it keeps you really going and it takes a few years to get in train is having things um, 
going re- ready to go yeah, yeah. and and th- little projects here yeah. and there working towards this working towards that like I spoke recently to an artist who's actually a jeweler and a and a yeah you know has a young child and really wants to get you know back into her practice and and so she was ringing just to get some advice like how, how do I even get started and I I said have you made any work <laughs> You know, you you have to have work in the making and in the ready um, to go and approach galleries to yeah. take part in, uh, you know, markets or exhibitions or, like, it's great to have all sorts of good ideas but um, people want to see what you're making. Yeah. Well, we so, see this a bit yeah. with people asking us for advice where they have the idea of the exhibition but no work nothing so and also back to what you said about resolving work like you yeah. often have to make a lot to get to, to get that exactly stage of yeah what you want to exhibit yeah and and we we're, we're all working in clay like like clay is not fast <laughs> you know um i Personally, an object might take a, a couple of weeks to make. It then has to dry for three weeks extremely slowly or it's going to crack. I, you put it in the kiln, I don't know if it's going to come out the other end. So you have to have all this sort of almost contingency of, yeah. of things, of, of backup, and you don't really know what's going to come out the other end. But I think, yeah, it's important to have some resolved work to, to approach anybody and, um, and um you know even do some work in terms of you writing and thinking conceptually and uh, about what you're doing who am I what's my voice what have I got to to say so when people ask you those things and that's not always easy and and you know going back to what we said before you often have to do an artist talk when you're presenting your work and and I mean, once upon a time, I probably would have just thought of that as a as a something at the end of it all, and go, "Oh, look, I can just talk about that. That's fine." My whereas now I take that part probably a lot more seriously, and you know, spend just as much time over a period of time really thinking about what I'm doing and documenting that and writing that down so that I can um, articulate when it's, you know, because you, you you forget half of what you want to say and, and you've had all these, you know, ideas and things running around in your head for a big period of time and then you're faced with an audience and it's like, oh, it's all gone now. <laughs> so I think, I, and I mean, I just I learn so much when I go and listen to other artists speak, and some people are great at articulating really well. So I think it's um, you know, if, if you need a bit of help to do that, it's great to seek that out as well. Yeah. Well, the other thing I've been developing uh, this is this is my life. I've always got ten million ideas. Yes, in the many. Fire. Yes. Um, is a writing course, a short writing course, um, not. Sp- um, sort of aimed specifically at artist statements and stuff like Great. that. Right. Yeah, because, yeah, gosh, we've got to have so many skills. It's just such a bummer. Mm. <laughs> you, you know, you become great at potting and you think that that's your thing mm. and then you've got to also be a good writer and maybe you've got to be a photographer and, may, you know, you've got to also do all these. You've got to be an accountant. And, yeah. You know, yeah. Just speaking lots of different languages, isn't it? Yeah. It's like, you think that you've chosen art because visual language is your thing and then you've got to write about it. Yeah. But also the more you go on, each bit of your writing is content and um, yes. that, that is an asset in your business, like yes. just in a professional practice. Where Absolutely. The more little tiny bits of writing you've got, even if it's just one sentence, mm. like, you know, Shana Garson is an artist who lives in Jinnabara Gin- country um, yeah. and throws porcelain. That's an asset. Mm. There may be a time where I have to have one sentence about my mm. work and I can just use that again and again. Yes. So all of those little bits of writing, they're so valuable and they can be reused a billion times. Exactly. And, yeah. yeah. Have a have your bio, have your artist statement, have all those things ready. And, and they change all the time, obviously, and artist statements will. But, you know, even a generic one that you add and subtract to, I mean, often there's a core of that that's what is my work about. But you and I and, would never write one from scratch anymore. Or we would just no. start by bouncing off something we've already had. So that's like a business asset. <laughs> that's interesting. I've noticed writing out of statements because it's always the thing I do the night before. 
Um, I always go, I should have done that earlier because it actually cemented it, my concept and would have actually made yep. my work stronger yep. if I'd kind of written something in yeah. the beginning mm. because I'm like, oh, yeah, that's what I'm trying to do. Mm. And, oh, why did I choose that form? That was just I didn't really think the form through while I picked the colours and the just for an example. Yeah. yeah. I mean, often you're having those conversations in your head, but it's great to just document those even, you know, it might be dot point, word point as you're going. I've always got a piece of paper next to my, I mean, I'm not a big writer. It doesn't come easily, but it's great to, you know, I use all of that then when I do have to write and I do definitely give myself plenty of time because also once you, if you're applying for residencies and things like that, it's important to have, um, you know, they want to know what's your project, what's your work about. So I think it's really important to, and there's no rules as in you don't have to, you know, there's there's very um, intellectual art speak, there's people who write very conceptually and there's people who just, it's the bare bones and it's from the heart and this is what my work is. No, they're all right. None of them are wrong, you know. So you don't. There doesn't have to be a particular formula in terms of writing about your work. I think the more honest you are to who you are and what your story is, the better. Um, making up something, you know, just be, because you have to, and and that With lots uh, of adjectives, and that part, <laughs> yeah, that people are just going to read and go, I don't know what they're talking about, is completely useless to the audience and to yourself so yeah but one thing I would say if you're having trouble starting because I've been on a f- quite a few grants panels is describe what your work looks like you know it's just so important for grants panels there'll be people on there who are not ceramicists mm. or woodworkers or whatever your work is just say something like I make sculptures out of porcelain based on you know, uh, botanical forms. They hang on the wall and they are about this big, Mm. 30 centimetres big, Mm. whatever. Straight away, the person, whoever, has has an idea of what you make. Uh, Like I see so many other statements or grant applications where it's like, what the hell is this person making? I just can't even understand at all what they're doing <laughs> like what is it is it a performance or is it a piece of art or is it a, a yeah you know a yeah. script I, I just have no idea so yeah description but that's also a good way to start writing because it's usually the easiest thing mm. to do to look at your work and mm. describe it <laughs> that's great advice that yeah. really is yeah. a lot of time like reading about other artists work and sometimes there can be some language that's uh, inaccessible if you're not familiar to art speak mm. or the art world. Mm. And I think people read that and try and take that on but don't fully understand it. It ends up getting a bit convoluted and, you know, chunky. and It can be really alienating for can, some people too yeah. and so they distance themselves from your work as well. So, yeah, I mean, I would definitely – some people can write beautifully and some yeah. people, you know – it doesn't come so easily but um make it accessible you know and going back to if if you're honest about what what you're making and not making something up then then you're including other people in that in that you know how they I mean everyone's going to interact with your work whatever way they want to anyway but it's it's always good to know what what's the intention behind yeah and sometimes that begins to change the story yeah. And I'd also say in in light of that, also story sells. So once you've written your description, you might have a story, like you might say the first time I saw the brachycarden blah, blah, blah was in, you know, my garden in 1986 in Toowoomba and I've been thinking about it ever since. Like immediately you're like as a viewer, you're plunged into that story. You want to know what happened after that. So narrative's important. Yeah. Mm. Did you guys mm. see, um, I think it was Anna Louise Richardson's show at the Condensary. It was called The Good Egg. She had the most beautiful art descriptions. Was that all the panels? The big charcoal. Yeah, I, I didn't yeah. get to see it. They had great She's shows She's a fantastic there. writer. Yeah. She wrote like, because there was one of the main works was a big I read, drawing of an egg. I it was, read it. Yeah, yeah, it was just great. Yeah. It was just about collecting the eggs in the morning with her kids and, 
I mean, really, she was addressing industrial agriculture. Yeah. She did it through this little story about collecting eggs mm. and a cracked egg is just the morning's breakfast. When you're on the farm while in an agricultural system, it becomes waste. And so it was just this little kind mm. of mm. great little story that encapsulates yeah. such the conceptual kind of underpinning of family, like just everything. And I was like, wow, mm. I learned a lot from that. Mm. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I think it's important. Yeah. And, I mean, even for some people too it can be about um, the process of making and, mm. and for people who, who aren't makers just um, what does that feel like? What does that look like when you're actually throwing a pot and, you you know, it might go all wonky or it does what it, yeah, like just describing what you're doing can be mm. information. So, um, yeah, it doesn't, there's no, that's, understanding that there's not really any rules as to what you're writing other than yeah be sort of clear and concise and and talk about your 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 intention but if if for you that if process is your big thing write about it yeah that's great really really um helpful thank you <laughs> yeah right. i feel like this has been a master class <laughs> yeah. I know, I'm like, oh, we need to listen back and just yeah. Notes and, yeah. Thank you both so much. Oh, it's goodness. a pleasure. I mean, I know there's so much more we yeah. could talk about. Yeah. Do you have anything else you'd like to ask? Um, do you each have maybe a piece of advice, a single piece of advice that young you as an artist would have really benefited from that maybe anyone listening could? could I know one because I was talking to my daughter last night about it. Yeah. Um, so she's in grade 12. But one, what I would say is that when I was starting, I would sometimes look at other people and think, oh, you know, they've already had, you know, five exhibitions and I haven't had any and, you know, I haven't done this or that and, you know, time is going past even though I was only 20. But I would say that you're in a long, you're playing a long game, you know. After 10 years, you will think, it, does, it didn't matter if you had an exhibition in, you know, when you were 20 or when you were 22. You, you build up so you don't feel this sense that you're missing out because you haven't done something yet because if you're committed to the long haul, then it's going to be okay. <laughs> yeah, I guess you try and you're sort of grasping onto everything or, you know, what you're wanting everything, yeah, yeah devouring yeah. everything. I have to think about this for a little bit longer. <laughs> I probably could have given myself heaps of advice. <laughs> Hindsight is, you know, is a good thing. No, I, I can't think of what. I think we've covered so much. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's lots of advice. And, um, and, you know, perhaps some of the advice we've just been giving would have, yeah, <laughs> would have been helpful. Yeah. I like the um, honest artist statements. That's a good yeah, one. Yeah, yeah. Just be honest. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I was lucky. I, I, you know, sort of went through art school with some really strong women who um, who I really respected and probably feared at times and who's critical at, even though it hurt at moments um their you know their ad advice was um so beneficial to and and perhaps perhaps people who have experience can see your potential and often people won't waste their time giving you advice if they don't think that you're worthwhile you know speaking to and and talking to and you know if you're a young artist as Shannon said you don't want to quash anyone's excitement and enthusiasm you you want to encourage them but um I think you, you know those women really showed me the way in terms of um they were strong feminists you know in a sort of postmodern time it was it was it was almost you know all this new textile work and video work was coming out and that was um so beneficial to me but yeah I, I can't think of one particular thing sorry not much oh, help no, there. Well, so. <laughs> I think the biggest takeaway piece of advice I've taken from you is seek critique so that mm. could be it mm. yeah yeah seek critique I mean we were lucky that was part of the course it was I was you know when it was critiqued time mm. I was absolutely terrified but it was so good yeah, yeah. and you had to be you had to have you know you had to be able to go look this is this is just an idea this is uh, this is sort of work in the making 
or I've been really lazy and I haven't done much work and <laughs> and you knew you were you know in for it what are you what are you doing here <laughs> they were honest and they were fierce but they that they I just ran with it you know so I sort of um I I owe quite a bit to to my early lecturers I have to say you know Oh, it's wonderful. Beautiful. Yeah. Beautiful. Well, we're obviously so grateful to have My you pleasure. To be here. Yeah. Thank you both. Thank you so, for um thank you for asking us. Oh, it's been <laughs> wonderful. Thank you both. And we'll put um your Instagram handles and that in the show notes. Oh great. Thank you. And yeah. um your upcoming shows and things that are happening. So yeah. yeah. So you guys can check them out in the show notes. Yeah, check them out. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Jane. So thank you, Rora. <laughs> Thanks so much for listening to this episode. We hope you enjoyed. You can find us on Instagram at birdsofclay underscore podcast. Please feel free to send us any questions or comments. And if you could leave us a review on whatever platform you're listening on, that would be amazing. We'll see you next time.